Welcome everyone to the Vision Straight Masterclass Suite. I'm Obi Malopi, an optometrist based here in the motherland. Of course, that is the beautiful South Africa. When we started this masterclass series, we wanted to introduce IK community to extraordinary leaders, trailblazers, phenomenal uh, IK leaders who are doing extraordinary things uh, in the IK industry in taking IK to our, the highest possible level of excellence, revenue growth and transformation. Some of these people that we are featuring are not necessarily those people that have utilized social media platforms to showcase the wonderful work uh, and the type of leaders that they have built their careers into. And they literally just use social media for just what it's supposed to be, just connecting with lo lovely people and just having fun. And I want to show you guys that some of the incredible organizations that the world or the IK community has been accustomed to knowing that are known for extraordinary IK businesses or practices are not necessarily just up dependent on the faces that we are, uh, are familiar with. And today I've got one of the greatest, greatest privileges by interviewing someone that I've had the privilege of spending time with, breaking bread, uh, learning from, and that of course is the incredible uh, Nicholas uh, Black. How are you today, sir? Oh, great, thanks. It's a gorgeous day here in the UK. So uh, we're seeing spring at last. So everything's starting to turn the corner and looking brighter. Where specifically are you in the? Are you based in the UK? I'm based in Herefordshire, which is in the west part of England on the Welsh borders. So very rural, as you can see behind me. Um, a lovely part of the world um, to live in and to practice in. Your accent has a. You've got like a dual accent. Uh, I know where you're from, but someone who's watching this right now does not know where you're from. They cannot necessarily pick up on that British accent alone. It's like attached with something else on it. So where are you from? Please tell people who is Nicholas Black, where are you from? How did you enter this amazing profession that we are all in, referring to IK, of course? Yeah, well, my accent is mixed up and uh, I don't quite fit in anywhere these days. Um, my early years, the first 20, 20 odd years of my life were from in New Zealand. Um, so all my uh, school education, my upbringing and uh, um, undergraduate degree in psychology, um, all done out in New Zealand. Um, I, I grew up in, um, in a family of optics. Um, my, my grandfather was an optometrist. My father was a dispensing optician and uh, they had their own practice in Lower Hutt, New Zealand. Um, I have an uncle who was uh, involved in manufacturing and uh, a cousin who's an optometrist. So there was quite a, a big link to optics in my formative years. Um, and I tried my best to not get caught up in it. Um, but... It pulled me in slowly, um, and uh, after I went to university, I spent a couple of years working in a, in a lab, which gave me a real interest into actually what I was doing, um, and, uh, and then I came traveling to the UK. So um, 1993, I knew I was going to go for a while, so for my 21st birthday, I got a one-way ticket. <laughs> Uh, and I'm still here. So and so I did all my optics based training in the UK. So I came over 93, completed the dispensing optician, a fellowship of um, a dispensing optician through ABDO by correspondence. So I worked full time okay. um, doing doing that. So it meant that I could be working, living in, 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 in the local community. Um, and that's really where I found my love for for optics you know it, it really enjoy what i do um and uh, and then worked around different places in the uk um being a a foreign national i had no specific base so that gave me the opportunity to try my wares and learn from different people in different environments and i think that was that was important to help shape who i become wow wow that is a Fantastic, uh, fantastic uh, journey that led you into IK. Um, not many people uh, in the industry would say that they've got 
the the entire family <laughs> <laughs> in optometry or eye care. So that's a very I didn't know that about you that um, that's how you actually uh, landed up in optometry. But how did I mean you're wearing a a, a, a t-shirt there with uh, the, yep. the, the the award-winning practice that the entire IK community knows, whether it's someone who's in Zimbabwe or someone in Brazil uh, or Puerto Rico or America or Australia or New Zealand, there isn't anyone in the IK community who is not privileged enough to at least uh, at a minimum hear about BBR optometry. Uh, how did you end up being one of the, um, the leaders, the, the, the directors at BBR optometry? Well, that, that was a journey in itself. Um, partly there's there's chance opportunities involved. Um, you know, at, at the time I joined, I've just celebrated my 20 years at BBR Optometry. Oh. <laughs> um, thank you. And I, when I first um, saw a job interview or saw a job advert in, um, in 2001, I wasn't particularly looking for a job but this lifestyle advert jumped out at me and we had a young family and we were living in a, in a built up area. And so we decided to take the plunge and move to rural Herefordshire to, to bring the children up in, a, in, in an environment that was maybe closer to, to my experiences in New Zealand. Um, and, and it just happened that when we moved um, and, and was accepted for a job at BBR, there was two senior partners who who were in the process of um, taking that next stage towards retirement. So all of a sudden there became an opportunity that was possibly there. Um, so one of the things that I, I did did do is I expressed my you know desire to to become involved in a practice, whether it be BBR or or, or let um, the bishops and, and Nick Rumley know that, that that was a direction of travel that I wanted to achieve um, so that there was sort of transparency of, of, of what I wanted to achieve. Um, and, you know, and that allowed a sort of timing to, to happen. Um, interestingly, it was several years later before that formality became um, uh, uh, more structured, but in that process, in that time, there was a number of things that happened to sort of almost test the waters, um, and and that's where um, Nick Rumney bought the practice in two thousand and three, and so he was sort of a sole owner. So it was a big responsibility, and so there was a number of factors that he tended to. Um, disseminate um, different different responsibilities and roles to different people. To, and one of that one of that reasons is to understand how people react and uh, and perform when you when you pick up different things. Um, and he was very good at sort of sharing those skills and responsibility. Um, and that helped to evolve a number of individuals within the practice. Um, and and for me, it, it showed him that uh, I was uh, capable of taking on a, a more extensive role. Wow, that is that is so uh, interesting to hear because you you had a clear picture of the type of optometrist that you or the type of IK leader, whether it be in dispensing, whether it be as an optician, uh, but you knew exactly what you wanted to become. Uh, years down the line and you made that very clear from the onset and I think one thing that young people uh, who are entering the IKM market space right now that's something that they can learn from just that example of being very clear of number one the type of practice that you want to be associated with and the type of career aspirations that you might have you need to be lined up with a practice that can be able to harness that that can be able to to, to take you to that next level. And one thing that I like about what you just said, it's not something that happened immediately. You had to prove yourself. You had to show yourself. You had to do things that can show you that you've got the capabilities of a leader. You've got the capabilities of taking more responsibility. And I think a lot of young people want the titles now 
as well as the benefits now, not realizing that you have to work into your role so that the time that it's given in, uh, into your lap, it's somehow an obvious choice because you've mm. already been doing the work that the business or the environment requires of you without you even having the necessary title or the perks. So I've actually learned something from you just by that because I realized that I do a lot of speaking engagements with young people. That's the first thing that I actually need to be telling them to say, hey, don't be quick to want to get to this level without putting in the work from the onset. So thank you very, very much. Yeah, I mean, and the other part of that that's that's really important is, you know, part of that journey is is learning and and you won't be perfect. Um, so you need to understand that as individuals, we grow sometimes by the mistakes we make. And and as leaders, we need to understand and respect that the mistakes are good um, and they, you know, they will happen. Um, and to not necessarily pull people up on them, but maybe help them understand where things maybe didn't go quite quite according to plan um, so that they're in a better shape for the future. I like that. I like that. Just an interesting question. Uh, you mentioned uh, the bishops as uh, the previous owners. Uh, there's someone who's asking, what does BBR stand for uh, today in 2022? And because if you're saying that um, uh, uh, Professor Nicholas Romney uh, uh, took over the practice on a full-time basis as owner in 2003, but he had already been in that practice long before then, um, can you just give us a, a breakdown of exactly what does BBR stand for and all of that? Well, on BBR started in 1969, um, and 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 it was it was the two bishops, husband and wife team, um, and their vision was was quality eye care in terms of delivering clinical expertise and understanding. Um, so they they knew that there was a difference of what you could do. Um, so they believed in in further development of their, of themselves. So Mrs. Bishop became the first optometrist to qualify as an orthoptist as well oh, in the UK. Oh. So she bought children's specialties. Oh. And, and Mr. Bishop, he, he developed his contact lens. So he became a specialist contact lens optician. And be, they both became involved with the local hospital and these additional sort of um, skills, skill set to mean that when they brought that back into practice, that they were delivering higher levels of clinical expertise. And that was really the basis that they set out the practice on all those years ago. And that's what also attracted Nick Rumney when he came in 1991. Um, you know, it was that, that vision that we can deliver better care. Oh, and, and, that, and, and that is what Nick has built in, in, in that time and that what we, what we continue to build and drive um, in terms of that, that vision and, and, and excellence. Um, and, you know, now we also want to do, you know, make sure that we deliver that within the spectacle world as well in terms of the frames, the lenses, you know, and, and so we have a whole portfolio of, of skills and, and knowledge to trans to transfer to to the people that come and see us who who need our skills. Wow, wow, that is uh, so. Vision was actually uh, a key component of what you guys were able to build, and the legacy that had already been started um, almost fifty years ago. <laughs> so it's it, there was a clear plan of action in terms of this is what we want to be building. Uh, going forward, and we will not compromise on the standard of what we want to be building, whether it be from a clinical point of view, whether it be from a service and products point of view. But most importantly, uh, you guys, I, I, I was fortunate enough to visit your lovely practice in 2018, if I'm not mistaken. And I got there and I got the shock of my life when I found like a hundred people <laughs> working in your guys' practice, but everyone had a sense of belonging. 
there was a sense of unity. There was a sense of community. There was a sense of a clear leadership. There was a sense of team involvement. There was a sense of people taking responsibility, authority in their specific departments. There were, there were multiple departments. There was a system in place. There was leaders in place. There was the directors, yourself, uh, um, uh, all three of you. There's three of you, correct? Yes, yes. Myself, Nicholas Romney, and uh, Suzanne Wadsworth. Correct. And, and um, we also now have Imran Hakim as, an, as one of our directors as well. Correct. And when, 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 when I saw this and I was like, but it's not very often you see an organization focused on this high level clinical excellence, but at the same time, focused on its people. And I saw that there's a system, there's a structure in place when it comes to how you build relationships, how you deal with your employees, how you elevate them, how you equip them, and how you attract uh, quality individuals to the practice, young and old. Uh, I, I was fortunate enough to be exposed to, 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 to your team in the sense that they were all at different stages of their lives, uh, whether it be personally or professionally, and yet they, find, they found a sense of belonging when they were in your guys' uh, environment. Can you please break down how invested you guys are as the leadership of the organization when it comes to leadership, people de development? What, what, what is the, the reasoning behind that type of environment being the way it is? Because for me, I base everything that I do as vision straight on yeah. what I saw happening in your guys' practice. <laughs> well, it's nice of you to say that. I mean, it was great to have you up. And, you know, we have some amazing staff that work for us. And I think, you know, the practice is only as good as the team. And as, as individuals, we can have all the drive in the world, but we have only got a finite capacity to deal with what we can deal with. And so, so we need a team that believes in what we want to achieve that has a common goal and there is constant development and training and investment in those individuals okay because because we need them to keep that energy um we want them to deliver each deliver the best care that they can each deliver um so and one of the things we've done is we've been involved with investors and in people for almost 20 years now um, and that's a that's a process uh, or an external auditing system in the UK, which actually assesses how you structure your organisation to train um, and understand your your team. Um, and that, that that has been really helpful. I mean, it's something we've always done, but it do, it did put a structure around around that sort of individual development. Um, we do regular assessments in terms of appraisals. Now, you know, part of that is to understand where they are on an individual basis, on a personal level, as well as a professional level, because, you know, we've been living in, 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 in challenging times over the last, you know, couple of years, and, and everybody's journey has been, been different. They've had different challenges, whether it be um, financial, whether it be emotional, whether it be mental, you know, and, and we need to, understand all that and respect them as as individuals um but we constantly are evolving and, and and investing in that in that knowledge that they have um how many just on that topic because there's a young optometrist or young business owner who's seven years uh, into running his or her optometry practice right now and they look at organizations like BBR Optometry and so many others, and they want to get to that level. But when it comes to the type of in, uh, people that they, they, they employ in their businesses, I want to ask you just a few quick fire questions. Yeah. Just in terms of that young optometrist or business owner can get a sense of the investment that you guys actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. I want to ask you, number one, I, didn't, I know we didn't prepare for this, but uh, I, I hope that's why. Uh, how often is staff training? Uh, we, we have um, at least a couple of, of, of short meetings each month 
um, but as part of your individual appraisal, there will be a plan of what are the key things you need to work on. So you have an individual plan, and then of course you have a practice plan. Right. I'll, but I'll wind it back a little bit because you know when you say about someone who's wanting to develop something, I think it's important to have a vision and a plan. Okay, now as soon as you develop a vision you've got something to aim for. Now, it doesn't mean you need to plan to be there tomorrow, but if you if you plan something for three years or for five years, you know, you've got a target that you're aiming for. Now, more often than not, you will get closer to the target if you set a target than if you don't set something. So, so there is an element of, you know, believe in yourself and what you want to achieve but but do set yourself goals. Wow, wow, wow! I love that. I love that. I love that. Um, it costs money to grow anything. Um, your team obviously goes through periods where they themselves have career aspirations. I've seen people in your organization perhaps work at the front office, but next thing they end up being involved in your IT department, getting <laughs> your social media department, how much investment from a financial point of view, is it important for optometry business owners to be financially be the <laughs> that invest in the continuous development of its people or should that be the responsibility of the uh, employees themselves? Because some business owners will have that approach where they say, I'm gonna invest in my people, make them better, uh, within their professional skills, but they're going to end up leaving me and going to further uh, explore other opportunities. And they end up not investing in their people as a result of that. Why do you guys keep on investing? Um, I, well, I think it's, it's, it's not a difficult one because um, for us, um, you know, we can look at investment, we can look at training, but one of the things we do we do do is if we know we've got a specific investment, so it may be um, uh, someone that's been a receptionist, clinical assistant that wants to train as a dispensing optician. Now that's a significant cost yes. over a significant period of time. Now we have we have trained up four or five people now into that role. Um, but, what? I've got a neighbor's dog that's gone a bit nuts. Look, in the background. Look, but, is, but, your background, I wish I was there right now. So, <laughs> don't, don't mind. So, <laughs> no, no. So, so, but what we do is we have a training contract, which okay. is transparent. So if we say, right, we're going to invest £5,000 a year for three years, this is something that we want to do to develop you. Now, we're happy to do that, but we want to sign a contract to say that at the end of this, we want to um, have a minimum of, of two years or three years um, uh, post-qualification um, guarantee that you, you're staying. Now, it doesn't mean that they have to stay, but it means that actually your investment is protected. And there's a complete transparency right. between the employer and employee. So they know what commitment is involved and they also know what costs are involved. And, and I mean, as an organization, you will have people that you train and you give them wings and they will fly. And if you do that with a positive um, encouragement, actually you will develop relationships that will Will, will be the foundations for, for for great things in the future. And, you know, if you don't develop them, what type of employee do you have? You have one that is maybe less engaged, they don't feel as invested in. And so the risk is by not investing in them, your team morale, your team motivation becomes watered down or diluted. Wow. 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 <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> that's insane. That's like <laughs> I love that. I absolutely love that. Um, in sticking on the same topic, because you've obviously built that 
employee employer relationship on trust. Trust is obviously a key component within the business. Ha, ha, has that trust been broken before? Oh, I, I think when you're dealing with people, you always have challenges. I mean, um, yes, we have had occasions where maybe things haven't gone according to plan, but you have to back yourself that you've got the structures um, and uh, and processes in place to to deal with that. And you know, it it's never it's never nice, but when things go awry and they have the power of the team is really, really powerful um, because they know that as an employee, you do your best and they, and they can see when things break down, there's normally a reason for it. And if you act with good faith, with good spirit, um, then, then everything comes out in the wash and the team is stronger for it. Wow. Wow, love that, love that. Uh, BBR Optometry is known as a an award-winning, high-level, clinically-based optometrist. You guys have a program currently running at in the practice, or that has been running for years, where uh, young, newly qualified optometrists come to the practice. So there's a lot of people that are coming to want to work uh, and expand themselves within BBR Optometry. What are some of the challenges that you guys have found uh, are involved in running the type of practice that you guys run, where it's got uh, multiple dispensers, a, a, a contact lens clinic, a dry eye clinic, uh, a low vision clinic, uh, a, you know, uh, pathology is taken very, very seriously in the organization. Uh, spectacle eyewear is taken very, very seriously. There's multiple facets to BBR optometry. What are some of the challenges that you find you have had to deal with more often than not? That's the first part of the question. The second part of the question would be then, uh, I've seen it here in South Africa and other parts of the world that COVID-19 uh, was really bad for a lot of businesses. So you have found that uh, some optometry practices have ended up merging with one another. One optometrist is coming with a certain skill set and another one is coming with a set, a different skill set, and they end up merging into one practice. But, and now you've got two directors or three directors having to work to one another in building this amazing optometric practice. So the second part of the question would be, at a leadership level, uh, how often do you guys discuss the vision of the practice amongst yourselves as the leaders? And how often do you have to end up butt butting heads or being on the same page with one another where you're investing in the practice? Uh, when do you take, uh, take a step back? When do you put more investment in the business because you're looking at five years from now instead of just looking at the circumstances at right, at where they are right now? Um, okay. Well, speaking about the, the first, first element of that, I think um, I can... I can sort of go back to COVID has a part to play in this last um, couple of years. And I, I think there's, there's probably resonance with a number of people um, in, in, in our world is that, you know, sometime within business, we just get busier and busier and we can, we can get confused with busyness and business. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, it, if we don't sort of manage ourselves, we become busy fools. Wow. Um, and, you know, for, from, a, from a COVID point of view, we've had a moment in time where we've been able to stop um, or pause, you know, and, and reflect on the way we've done things and, and, and maybe and change our businesses for better um and you know we uh, you know we have 20 staff and we have six consulting rooms we don't have six consulting rooms going full chat all the time but there's a there's a level of activity that that happens and some days are much busier than others and one of the challenges for us is to have enough activity but not overstretch the organization 
Mm. And mm. and there's there's an evolution of understanding and evolving that. And and most organisations have that sort of pivot point. If you get too busy, you're actually your your performance is not as good. Um, and and so you know we've been able to sort of rebuild our business in a in a slightly different model um since 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 covid which has meant that we've been able to manage that flow of people um the volume of people that we see and deliver better levels of clinical service and better levels of customer experience and the outcomes are that we've actually become a, a a more effective business. Um, so, so one of those challenges is, you know, is how we manage our own time and our own aspirations. You know, what do we want to drive? Um, and and as 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 owners and and leaders, we also need to make sure that we invest in the business because if we're just busy, we we don't have the time. To be able to deliver those. Now we have a great team around us who who take on and share a number of these responsibilities, but we still need that time to reflect and and come together. So we do, you know, gather our ideas and understanding and visions um, so that we can can translate that from the board down to the practice manager, the HR manager, other staff in in, in leadership roles. Um, one thing we do do is once a year we have an away meeting where we pull in key people in the organisation and we have a strategic vision. So we, we're we about to have that. It was due to be uh, this week, but it's now been deferred until May, where, where we, we look at the, the business in terms of one year, three years, five years. Where do we want it? And we split the business into... The into different components, the clinical, the commercial, and then the customer service side of it, and 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 then sub teams, subgroups within the practice will then work on each of these different areas um, with with some director input. But actually, it's invo- important that that the the organisation has um, the scope to see that vision and be involved with that vision um, because ideas come from all all areas of practice and if we don't if we don't capture those ideas um we miss opportunities wow 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 <laughs> that's that's like a master class within a master class within a master class that you have just unpacked there um we need to get you more in front of the camera by the way this thing of yep. people, uh uh just sticking there to bbr optometry it's unacceptable the world needs to hear more of you because you are sharing such valuable insight and, and, and pearls of wisdom with, with us today because it's I'm learning a lot. I'm learning a lot. It's changing my approach to how I'm doing things. I wanted to ask you, you have a special interest in low vision. Yes. Can you please uh, unpack your areas of competency Yep. So as a, as a dispensing optician, I've done further education in, in low vision. So low vision uh, relates to um, anyone where spectacles um, don't necessarily provide the outcomes um, to help them with their day to day. And low vision is one of those things that's very patient centric. Um, as, as a low vision per- practitioner, I can do a finite component um, that I can help with. And so it's really multi um, disciplinary sort of communication and understanding. So um, I may be able to help them with magnifiers, um, uh, different types of higher powered spectacles, telescopes, things like that, which which may help them to achieve some of the components that they need to to see. But this individual may struggle at home with things like the microwave or the cooker or turning the washing machine on. So I also need to be engaged with, with people in the, in the social world who can, um, can, can, can attend their house to understand, you know, is there any risks or concerns from a day-to-day basis? Because, you know, helping someone to read the, 
read their their um uh, communication that comes through the letterbox is one thing but make helping them to make a cup of tea or make help um uh, keep cooking and their independence is is other factors so that there's there's this relationship with other people and also we in hereford we have a community based um, provision so it's it can be either referred in from other optometrists the hospital self referral through the social arm so there's lots of lots of different elements within that and there's real maturity about how we um uh, organize that and relate to different practices um so that you know i have a number of referrals come in from from competitors in the real world um and yet they come and see me for low vision and then they you know i write back to them um tell them what we're doing and they will return to there for their eye examinations spectacles and there's no there's no competitive sort of um dynamic it's there's a maturity about how we provide the best service for that one individual rather than our own invested interest the other side that i of specialisms i do have is i do have um contact lens training so so i do do specialist contact lenses so the odd scleral lens and uh, sort of cosmetic shells and and all sorts of things like that and 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 we we have uh, our local hospital contract for the specialist service so that's um that's good fun um and uh, you know really rewarding as well wow speaking of that you obviously um giving insight into a, speci- a particular niche service that you guys are providing as bbr optometry uh, one thing that i realized that COVID did it gave a lot of practices or a lot of optometrists a wake-up call that running a generalist optometric practice uh, you're constantly having to fight against technology and or technological advancements because a patient can always go online and look at a cheaper way of getting their eyes examined a cheaper way of buying a pair of glasses or ordering the contact lenses online but when a business specializes in niche optometric services or competency areas you end up attracting patients that need and depend on you and cannot go anywhere else but the optometric practice. Now, uh, a lot of practice owners are heading in that direction now where they want to develop their businesses and and carve out a path, whether it be in myopia control, whether it be in draw eye, whether it be in contact lenses and so forth. Uh, You said you have been in the practice for like 20 years now and Nicholas Romney has been there from 91. Now, when you joined 20 years ago, what was the number of staff people that were on board? Was uh, it it's less than we have. I think we had about 12 staff at that point. Wow. So, so as you were building the niche services, because you have a, a, a wide array of niche services that you guys um, are providing uh, to, the, to, to patients um, uh, on a day-to-day basis, how, how easy is it or how difficult is it for a young uh, optometrist or business owner who is thinking that I want to carve out a path for myself in contact lenses or pediatrics. In today's IK market, how difficult or easy is it uh, to do it? I think it, it comes back to, to that energy of that individual and also what they're wanting to achieve because your niche your niche market is still only going to be a finite capacity, finite amount of your work. Correct. I Correct. think, I think the key thing is is how you build the relationships with those patients. Now, our our relationship over the last fifty years has been based on educating those individuals, so they are more knowledgeable about whatever decisions they make, whether that be understanding why your examination is 40 minutes <laughs> why it is not the same same cost as up the road um and 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 why your spectacles are a certain amount of money because they've got the knowledge to understand what it is you're delivering and 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 the choice based on that education to engage with it and the more you educate 
those patients into why you do what you do and and how you do what you do the stronger that relationship becomes and 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 the then the less likely they are to 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 get services elsewhere now uh, as you develop those specialist skills that enhances that education that you're imparting and the knowledge that you're transferring so so they do become more engaged with you more invested in you but it's it's because of what you've given them um you know you, you've 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 furnished that relationship which they then understand why they come to you and 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 that goes through you know that that's that's the same whether it be an examination that is a pair of reading glasses or enhanced readers or or they don't need anything um, in terms of refraction but they know why they want to get a pair of sunglasses from you um, so it's you know it, it's that relationship that you're you're building and and establishing and you'll always have those people that that don't value what you what you have and you also need an element of of self-belief to say i can't be everything for everybody and so if that person doesn't want what i offer that's okay too wow wow i like that i like that uh I've learned so much from you today with <laughs> the pearls of wisdom that you have shared. What, what lies ahead for optometry in your view? Uh, for, the, for those newly qualified or the, those students in final year optometry school right now, uh, what, what, what is the future of eye care looking like for, for, for people in, entering the marketplace right now, wanting to build great, extraordinary businesses um, like BBR is built. How does what does it take? Let me, let me put it to you this way: <laughs> What does it take to build a business that's going to be lasting fifty plus years in IK today? Well, it's going to take self belief. Okay, um, and the way I look at this is is optometry has so much potential to develop. Okay, and you know. If we think of literature and music, you know, there's there's a set of people out there that say you can't come up with anything. Everything's already been done. OK, but yet you've got musicians that create fantastic new music. You've got authors that create fantastic new books. That limitation is within your own imagination. So true. Um, and and so so so, yes, there's. A lot of things have already been 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 um, changed and evolved and and, and 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 ideas developed, but we're not we're not finished, you know. And 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 you know, new people coming through have the scope to shape and change what we do in the future, just as much as as as, as those of us that have been involved in it in the past. Wow, oh, that's that's powerful. I love that. I love that. Uh, with the Nicholas Black, um, wow, <laughs> wow! This is this is what I've been. This has been a, an incredible interview. Um, um, uh, the the pearls of wisdom that you have literally just been sharing, absolutely, absolutely incredible. What, what do you love the most about IK, by the way? It's that engagement you get with people. It's you know it it is the relationship you build. And the and 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 the trust and and uh, you know when you see people value what you're engaged with, what you're doing, um, it is really rewarding. Wow. But as as much as that is so important, do you know what the development of staff and seeing them come on is a real driver. Um, you know, it is it is exciting when you see people go through the different journeys. Um, of their lives and and how they help to shape, you know, and support us in our journey. Um, so both staff and patients, you know, generate a huge element of uh, of satisfaction and enjoyment in, in what we do. Wow, that is absolutely amazing. And um, uh, as we're closing this uh, interview, uh, England plays New Zealand in the Rugby World Cup final. 
South Africa is not there for some strange reason, which we know currently that does not happen because South Africa is really the best rugby team in the world. But who do you support? Are you wearing <laughs> all blacks? Or are you I, I definitely dress in black. So, uh, <laughs> I, was, I was made to feel quite foolish last World Cup. I was out in Liverpool for a wedding and I went to the pub dressed in black and we got absolutely pummeled by England in the semi-final. Uh, but it's all with good grace, you know, so uh, <laughs> the best team wins and uh, South Africa has the best record in the World Cups. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, this has been a fantastic interview. Really, really appreciate you. Uh, please continue doing the fantastic and extraordinary work in taking people and taking eye care to a whole other level. The industry definitely needs more leaders like you. And I'm fully convinced that the people that are going to be watching this are truly going to be inspired, encouraged, motivated, challenged to look at where they currently are as IK leaders, IK professionals, business owners in the IK industry, and elevate their approach to IK excellence. So for that, I honor you, sir. And I wish you nothing but the success and all the best for the upcoming months and let 2022 be one of your biggest years as you celebrate your 20th year at BBR Optometry. And yeah, uh, everyone, I don't know if you have anything, parting comments that you want to say. No, it's been fantastic to, to, to have a good chat with you. You're, you are doing a fantastic job and your enthusiasm to spread the knowledge that you have is infectious. And it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you very much, sir. Everyone, Thank you. if you're not connected with uh, us on the Vision Straight platforms, make sure to head on to the social media right now. We are on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Check out our website, www.visionstraight.co.za. And make sure that most importantly, you subscribe to the YouTube channel because the Masterclass series by Vision Straight taking place right now is going to add so much value to everything that you do as an eye care professional because the people that we are featuring on the platform or on the series I have done extraordinary things in taking eye care to the next level so watch out for the next episode with yet another great leader uh, take care everyone <laughs>